Sonny Bill Williams is a rare breed, a confident champion of multiple sports in the arena. Outside of it, a shy man whose struggle with fame left him depressed and spiralling towards a world of addictions. He's won NRL premierships, rugby union world cups, became an Olympian in sevens and is a Kiwi boxing champion. Having joined the Bulldogs as a teenager, he famously fled the code and country to play rugby in France. In the process, he was given the biggest fine in league history. Breaking the Bulldogs' contract cost him more than $1 million, which his friends, including Anthony Mundine, helped him to pay. But he wasn't only running from the pressure of being a champion athlete too soon. He was also running from the man in the mirror. The beauty of this book for me is when you read it, you understand that I haven't quite reached where I'm trying to reach. I had many mistakes, um, many great heights, but I feel like the beauty of my story is that I'm a work in progress. I haven't, I know I haven't arrived yet, but I'm always trying to get better. You talk about being a very shy person. Um, you, you're quite quiet, reserved. When you're little, you like being around your mum. This, this strength that came from inside anyway, that, that is required to be an elite athlete. Was that always a, a tussle within you? I was so focused at making, making uh, a living out of footy because I knew it, how much it meant to not just me, but my family, my mom, my dad. Um, we had nothing growing up, you know, it wasn't, we didn't live in a household where it was, okay, son, sit down, I'm gonna talk to you about thriving. When you're in this professional space or in this professional environment, these might be the pitfalls that you might, have. it wasn't any of that talk, it was, man, we've got to pay the rent this week. So going, traveling to Australia, uh, making my debut at 18, I was always driven, you know, I'd train with them. Then I'd go home and I'd come back to the gym when no one was running, I'd train again. And, and, and that's all I knew because I knew that at that young age, I'm not gonna, I didn't see any of my people or anyone, family or anyone succeed from an educational point of view. But on TV, I could see there was a couple of brown faces playing on TV, you know, so ooh, I'm, you know, I'm pretty good at, at this thing called rugby, rugby league. I could make it. If I play on TV, then I'll be able to buy mom a house and maybe buy dad a flash car or something, something of, of, in those terms, you know, so. Is there a problem in having young people hop into an adult situation? And not just an adult situation, but the bubble of sport, because elite sport has to have that bubble to enable everybody to achieve at their highest physical standard. It's funny when you think about I'll answer that question, but I'll say like from the outside, when you think about sportsmen, sportswomen, and they're out there and they're performing, doing great things, all of a sudden we think, we put them on the pedestal straight away. Man, they've got it all worked out. How great are they? Uh, Role models. Exactly. And I know from experience that at a time I was playing some of the best football that I'd ever played, but off the field I'd, I was, you know, the unhappiest I'd ever been. What people need to understand firstly is that these young men and young women, they're young in society, they're going to make mistakes. It's important that A, you have a great leadership group within the four walls of your club because a lot of those older guys have walked that walk that these younger guys are walking. And I would also say, just banking on my own experiences, that they need to have skin in the game. Rugby league and rugby union, only over 50% of the players on field are of Polynesian or Māori descent. For us, a big thing is family, community. They need to understand that if they stuff up, it's not going to only going to affect them. As I know from experience, it's going to affect your mom, your grandma, your sisters, your brother, uh, your community. You know, it's going to bring embarrassment almost to them, and that's where you'll hurt the most. Is it a problem that? inside that sports bubble, because it's all um, arranged around winning, because that is the pursuit, that excuses are made, cover-ups are done. I is this part of the issue? How, how does sport deal with that in the future in order to become better? I've been in trouble. I've had drinking um, stuff-ups. Straight away, I'm put in front of the camera. Okay, I'm gonna go and do a two-day course. Then two weeks later, I'm playing unbelievable football again. Oh, all of a sudden, yeah, yeah, he's got no struggles anymore. 
you know, because he's playing good footy. He's doing, you know, I think gone are those days now. We get into a place where we're, we're starting to look deeper, what's under the hood, so to speak. Um, and I think- Is that going to make it better for young athletes? I hope so, I hope so. And so you're at the height of your career, peak performance, you're playing rugby league at the highest level for the Bulldogs. Uh, there are incidents, as you mentioned, that give you front page, back page headlines. Um, some of them are very negative. It all becomes overwhelming and you flee. What were you fleeing from? And at that point, you talk about being written as the most despised person in the country. How does that filter through a young person's mind and, and coming back from that? I think about those times and I, th and I just, I think it was a young man who didn't know what mental health struggles were. I didn't even know what that word was, uh, but a young man felt like he was trapped, felt like he was doing the right thing, but didn't know how to go about it. Running away from essentially the man in the mirror. And I thought all my problems would go away. I didn't drink at all until I actually made first grade, believe it or not. So I wasn't a party boy growing up. I was that driven and focused. But when it all came, within my first year, I had won a competition. Uh, I was voted in the top 13 players in the world. A massive upgrade in my contract. I was in a place where it was, back in the early 2000s, it was looked at as train hard, play hard, party hard. So obviously I just, I wasn't dealt or given the traits to be strong in what I believed and who I was. I'll just follow the leader. You know, okay, all of the boys are drinking, I'm going out and drinking, I was happy-go-lucky in that sense. Then came the struggles with the partying, with the, you know, the alcohol and drug abuse, you know, the womanizing stuff, treating women how they shouldn't be treated. All of this stuff it took away from me. I'd wake up in the morning and I'd just, it just eat away at my soul, but I didn't know what I was feeling. I wasn't saying, and I still wasn't saying no. I got to a place where I started to figure out that these things were detri detrimental to me. I wanted some empowerment and the people that I was starting to hang around with were giving me that um, it was just through actions. You know, I was at a stage where everything was just all encompassing and I just thought, you know, I've got to go. I wish that I had the strength and the, the confidence to sit there and go to the club at the time and say, look, although I'm playing some unbelievable football, I'm extremely unhappy. I'm trying to find myself. I don't really know what I'm doing but I want to be better, but I don't know what to do. I don't know where to turn. Uh, and obviously that's when faith came into the team, come into the equation, but I just took off because I was just, I just needed something new because I was really scared of what might, might come, you, what might become of me, you know? So when I look back at those times, I'm, you know, almost embarrassed with the, some of the decisions that I made. Uh, but at the same time, they say, you know, only from the depths of the darkness can you reach the highest of, of lights. For too long, um, I deceived myself by chasing the highs, the manufactured highs. Now I chase, chase the legit highs of the natural highs where I don't wake up in the morning feeling like crap. I wake up in the morning feeling like, bro, you're a good dude. Keep striving, you know? I just want to um, read a couple of quotes from people who I think you're um, very close to. One is Johnny Wilkinson, who you came into contact with when you moved to France and you swapped from rugby league to rugby union. He says, I remember thinking that this was perhaps the most physically gifted individual I had ever seen. He was never afraid to show his vulnerability. By doing so, he expressed total humility and humanity. I mean, that, that, that is an amazing thing to come from someone of his stature. But even more so, a Tunisian friend that you met also in France who said, Sonny is a better human than he is an athlete. This is high praise for someone who'd come from what was that pressure and that darkness and not being able to face yourself to front up in a, a new country. There's new languages, there's new inputs, there's different people. Was that like an awakening that definitely changed the future from then on? Well, I feel like, you know, deep down, I always feel like I've always been a decent human being. I just made poor decisions, selfish decisions. And that time in Europe was so vital in my growth 
And when I think about France, I think about it in twofold. It was so special because the on-field development I, I got from guys like Johnny Wilkinson, who I didn't know rugby when I went to play rugby. I grew up as a rugby league man, but I knew who Johnny Wilkinson was. You know, one of the best players to have ever played the game. And obviously he's seen the talent in me. But the confidence that he'd give me, like this guy, Johnny Wilkinson, pulling me aside on the field saying, what do you see? What do you think? I need the ball in your hand, Sonny. You know, I'm sitting there thinking, this is a World Cup, a World Cup winner, Johnny Wilkinson, talking to me like that. It gave me so much confidence in this new game that I was trying to play. Uh, but then off the field as well, I had a mansion there overlooking the beach and all of that. But majority of my time I'd spend with Maurice and his family in the projects, you know, because I felt more at ease, more comfortable. You know, walking the streets, no one knew who I was. Yes, it was a punch in the face to the ego, but it was a punch in the face that I really needed. And it was beautiful because it was like, man, this is what life is about. You know, there's no athlete privileges. You're more happy in the projects than you are in the flash house. What's that saying to you? It made those decisions to stay away from that party life a lot easier, you know, because I wanted that empowerment. I really love that empowerment. I love that feeling and, um, you know, that time, that I spent with Maurice and his family, my Kolo, my Tunisian Momo, Mama, um, was beautiful. I remember like nights before the games, I'd go over there and shoot, uh, Mama would make, um, they called them bricks, but it was deep fried, like it had everything that an athlete shouldn't eat, you know? <laughs> but who am I to sit there and, and say no to this beautiful lady who's prepared it for me all day, you know, chopping up the finer herbs. I'd sit there and eat it, you know? and. It helped me move from, okay, the selfishness that a lot of athletes have naturally because we've got to be on par, we've got to have the best nutrition, we've got to have the best recovery into the sense of the realness of life where it was like, this is life, alhamdulillah. So talk to me about Islam and, and when you finally committed to that. I've always grown up uh, with a strong belief in God. Uh, and I guess obviously when I went through that troubled time, I was gonna turn to God. Alhamdulillah, I found Islam. Um, for me, like we said earlier in the piece, I, I try not to get into spaces I'm not really too equipped to deal with. But what I'm equipped to deal with, like all of us are, is how I feel. And I feel happy. And that's what Islam has allowed me to do. I feel like the beauty of Islam is it's given me the structure needed to thrive in this world. Islam has given me the antidote or the medicine to heal the wound not just put the plaster over it. So for me, that's what it's done for my, for my life. It's turned that wildness, that young, wild, that young man's wildness uh, into positivity. And along with my mom's activism streak in me and my dad's caring, loving, empathetic heart, I feel like it's put me on the right path in life and no one can tell me different. When you look forward, what do you see? What do you still think there is still to come from you? But for me, I just want to be happy, you know, and I know to be happy, um, I need to be uh, uncomfortable in some places uh, because with that, there's no growth. Um, but also well, the future holds is, you know, one of striving to be a better man, a better husband, a better father, because, you know, that for me essentially gives me what I'm after in life and that's that happiness, you know and my kids and wife and my faith um, plays a big role in that. Do you see yourself as a leader, as a role model? I'm always reluctant to use that term with athletes because I think they play sport well, um, you know, but to put that pressure on them for every other part of life is very difficult. Uh, there was, a, you know, I think there was a time when I'd run away from that title, whereas now I, I take it a, a bit more serious, but I, 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 I think I connect with people in that space because of uh, the struggles that I'm vocal about, but the the discipline and the and the grit that I have to try and overcome them daily, you know. And if that means that I'm a leader, well, then so be it. But um, you know, I always strive to try and just be a good person, you know, and help. Sonny Bill Williams, thank you. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it.